Gillespie, I'm the museum director and chief curator. On behalf of our executive director, Ruth Applehoff, the board and the staff of Guildhall, I'd like to welcome you here this afternoon. We are truly delighted to be able to be hosting a conversation between Barry Schwabsky and Rafael Ferrer. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background information and then we'll be able to begin the program. Barry Schwabsky is the art critic of the nation. Schwabsky has been writing about art for the magazine since 2005. His essays have appeared in many other publications, including Flash Art, Art Forum, the London Review of Books, and Art in America. His books include The Widening Circle, Consequences of Modernism in Contemporary Art, Vitamin P, New Perspectives in Painting, and several volumes of poetry, <coughs> and his most recent being Book Left Open in the Rain. Schwabsky has contributed to books and catalogs on artists such as Henri Matisse, Jessica Stockholder, and Gillian Waring, he has taught at the School of Visual Arts, Pratt Institute, New York University, Goldsmith College at the University of London, and Yale University. Rafael Ferrer was born in Puerto Rico, and from an early age, Ferrer traveled between Puerto Rico and the United States, studying his teens at the Staunton Military Academy, and then went on to Syracuse University. In 1953, he returned to Puerto Rico, where he enrolled at the University of Puerto Rico. At Staunton, where he learned to play the drums, he had been involved with the Afro-Cuban music. In the early 1950s, he moved to New York to work as a musician. He was a professional percussionist until 1960, after which he used it as a means of support while he focused more on his artwork and as an artist in his studio. Ferrer's success began in the late 1960s with installations engaging conceptual and process art. The mediums Ferrer has worked in include sculpture, painting, drawing, printmaking, and installation art. Ferrer taught at several universities, the University of Pennsylvania, the Scohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, New York School of Visual Arts, San Francisco Art Institute, and the University of New Mexico. Living and working on the North Fork of Long Island since 1999, Ferrer has continued to his early influences, the visual world using only to spark the imagination. Along with paintings and a multitude of works on paper, including his on series of, ongoing series of paperback faces, he has developed a new format which enables him to combine his fascination for both images and words. Large blackboards installations, as you'll see on the other side. <coughs> He's had a major exhibition at El Museo de Barrio in 2010 entitled Retroactive. A noted artist, he was the recipient of two National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, an Adolf and Esther Gottlieb Foundation grant, a Pew Fellowship in the Arts grant, and in 2011, the Annalee Anna excuse me, and Barnett Newman Foundation grant. Before we begin today's talk, I want to extend special thanks to Esperanza Leon, who was the guest curator for our exhibition, and to thanks to Francois Ferrer for all of her assistance in mounting this exhibition. I would also like to thank our sponsor, our lead sponsor, Esterlita and Daniel Brodsky. Additional support from Mr. and Mrs. Edward Barlow, the Camp Lambshell Foundation, Lynn and Stuart Epstein, Nina Gilman, Elena Prohaska Glynn, Terry and Kevin Kennedy, Rosetti Perchick, and ServiceHampton.com. I just want to make two other announcements. There will be another lecture on Raphael Ferrer, and we left the um, notice on your seats, which is going to be on December 10th with Edward Sullivan. And I do hope that you'll have a time to look at Drew Shiflett's exhibition, and there's going to be a wonderful talk with Drew's work on December 4th. So without further ado, Raphael and Barry. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Well, I think, um, you know, as we were standing uh, here looking at the, the exhibition, uh, it was really um, something almost everyone was remarking on, the sheer uh, multiplicity of visual languages that we see here simultaneously in, in one space, which of course you developed over time. Yeah. but. In a way, that's been a curse uh, because <clears throat> I learned when you teach, you learn more than when than the student as a person. You learn more. And when I was teaching in Philadelphia, it was the first place I ever taught. Uh, I began to to learn about the whole thing of the procedure of teaching and. I, I really was incredibly impressed by the work of Paulo Freire and Ivan Illich, who were <clears throat> figuring out how do you teach uh, illiteracy, uh, how to, to deal with it. And <clears throat> the thing was that I had a seminar in 
that particular semester. And we began to investigate the whole idea of art education. And this is a, a roundabout way to answer what you're saying, but I think it's a terrific question, not only because it, it at least attempts to clarify something that's always, as I say, it's like a curse, because I learned that, see, I'm 78 years old, so when I be, wanted to become an artist, <coughs> the people that, that really uh, were my, my uh, you know, the, the people I looked up to, of course, <coughs> my Picasso, Matisse, that generation of European art. And through my teacher in Puerto Rico, Granel, I uh, met the surrealists firsthand. And so all of these people, Max Ernst, Lam, uh, the whole uh, international school of, of uh, art were people that, you know, they, they painted, they drew, they made sculpture. It went every which way, you know. Then, I was really incredibly uh, excited when I first saw Rauschenberg's work because he seemed to understand that and come out of a, a point of view where there was this kind of hybrid way of working that <clears throat> wasn't tied down to, to the idea of, of, of uh, uh, refining a product or, or to refining an idea. Now, I, I was able to trace that phenomenon, which I am a great critic of, because in my opinion, it's like, to me, the most terrible thing that can happen to a person is to be bored. And uh, nothing can be more boring than to refine a product. So the thing is that after World War II, the universities got all of this money from the GI Bill because there were so many <coughs> veterans of World War II that uh, were gonna go to school. So when the universities got this money, they said, well, why, what don't we have? Oh, we don't have an arts department. So immediately, art departments flourished all over the United States. And in due time, First of all, I, I you know I, I hate I don't want to get so that everybody thinks I I'm this cranky critical person that just can't stand all of it. But it, you know, in a certain way, the Spanish temperament is such that it really doesn't even like itself a lot of the time. <laughs> so you shouldn't take it too too seriously in the sense that a lot of what I have to say you have to take with humor because humor is the only hope that we have to be able to go through the day in some kind of intact condition. But in any case, the thing is that the people that were teaching art were people that couldn't or didn't, they wanted a job. They really were not interested in what they were doing. Now, Granel, the, the surrealist, I said to him one day in class, I said, after class, I said, how do you exhibit? He said, you don't exhibit, you don't sell. You don't do anything except you work. That's all you do. And I've had this weird personality since I was little that there are certain things that I always took seriously. And that's one of the things I remember. I said, so you don't do that. So when I moved, I was a drummer, but then in order to be able to pay my bills, I worked as a translator in New York City. I worked for the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, in these kind of things, and I've worked in, in many, many jobs so that I could be able to do my work. And eventually someone asked me, do you want to teach? And I said, teach what? And they said, art. I said, well, where? Because I didn't have a diploma. I never graduated. I don't have an MFA or BFA or any a, a, a or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is that this is, this is that, you know, this is the situation, you know. I, you know, then we get into the specifics of the 60s. I don't want to take the time, so maybe you want to. Well, no, I mean, uh, in a way you're coming at it from the direction of how, 
how it came about that you felt the, let's say, the freedom not to, not to stick to one line and, and just keep refining it. Let's let's kind of also look at it from the other side, looking backwards. Uh, when you put together a show like this, and you know you're looking back over uh, not the whole story, but a big part of the story, and trying to give form to this recollection of it, how do, how do you go about picking this? I, I that? don't. I don't. I gave up. I gave that up a long time ago. Fortunately, I have been saved because I've been married to my dear uh, Francoise for some 40 some years and I, you know, we, we have to divide our own situations and I know my limitations like Clint Eastwood said that one should. I do, I do know and, and she knows so much more about what you asked me than I do that I gave up that. So, you know, the installation, the way, the things that are picked out, I mean, she has a much better uh, sense because the thing about getting old is that not only do you get more intolerant but you also don't have any patience anymore. <laughs> so when she'll ask me what do you think? Do you think this or that? I said that. <laughs> so there's, there's certain room for arbitrariness uh, allowed. <laughs> Um, but, but you know, I just wanted to, to, to add something to that, which is that essentially uh, by saying Picasso and those, that generation, uh, I'm not trying to infer that there weren't tons of other artists that came out. Because one of the things that <clears throat> when you do art, you, you begin to love art more. Again, this is contrary to the code, because the code in school is you learn to network, but you never, you never give anybody ice in wintertime, because everything that you know, you have to keep for yourself. And I think that that's another one of these problems, you know, because you're doomed then to be this, this person like, like doing I mean, like so many of these guys have said, you know, we don't have inspiration. I'm not saying I have any inspiration, but I'm saying that they say we just go to work. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I go to have fun, just like I did when I played drums. That's why I stopped playing drums, because it wasn't fun anymore. I had to play terrible music to get better paid, to play the music I love. We would get $35 in the 50s and then $50 a night. That was like a lot of money, you know. But it, it's, a, it's a point of view. I never thought that art was a profession. I never thought I would be uh, put into the world to compete with people that were in business. I mean, that was one of the biggest turnoffs for me because my cousins all were huge successes in business. And I said, how can they not be? They're really dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, nothing personal. Because everything has exceptions, and of course that one is. But you know, anyway. So, uh, toward the let's say the, I guess the end of the '60s, you were involved in this whole situation of what some people called anti-form art, or uh, Post to minimal uh, art and so on, uh, transient uh, installations made with natural materials. Um, how did you, how and why did you come to make such a big transition uh, from there to figurative painting? From, <clears throat> well, I didn't begin with those things. I began. Uh, just you know painting on canvas and then that evolved into assemblage and then from assemblage it went into welded sculpture and when I was still living in Puerto Rico in, this, in the very early 60s I, I knew that I was gonna get a small grant from the government to leave the island 
and I wanted to write to David Smith saying that I could work as an assistant for free if only I could have the privilege of working with him and unfortunately within six months he died in a car accident so that didn't happen then I moved in 66 to Philadelphia being in Philadelphia I continued doing sculpture and I would go to New York City and and really see the whole gallery scene, which you could see, including museums, in one day, because there were not that many galleries. And it was manageable. <clears throat> so through that and, and the influences as we were all changing and whatever, uh, I began to, to do work that was influenced by <clears throat> people that were reacting against minimalism. and. Uh, so one particular experience was really important, which is I went to Leo Castelli Gallery in uh, 7, 7 East uh, 77th Street, or 4 East 77th Street. And uh, there was a show of Robert Morris, and he had a room full of string and, and wire and uh, all kinds of stuff, all strewn all, all over the floor. and. I was really shocked in the nicest way because I said, wow, this is, I can't believe this, you know. So I saw him standing by the door and I went up to him and I said, hi, you know, I, I uh, live in Philadelphia, but I've been doing some work for the University of Puerto Rico and the chancellor would like me to, to make contacts so that he wants to get things going in, in the university. And so anyway, that was the way that I, I uh, began to, to uh, deal personally with these people. And they were very generous and they were very uh, accessible. And, and, you know, within a short time, maybe a year, less than a year, uh, I could tell you the whole scope of that group, which were essentially Bob Morris is maybe two years older than me, but the the people that were coming out in that moment, 1967, 8, mm -hmm. were all 10 years younger than me because I had been a drummer for that period. So I'm talking about people like Richard Serra, Keith Sonier, Bruce Nauman, Barry LeVay, Eva Hess, I mean, did all of Bill Bollinger. So I got to meet all, all of these people and you know, I, I just dealt with, with the opportunities as they came according to who I am. I mean, uh, I had no idea. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't go to university, so I didn't know where the, these people were coming from. So essentially, that was the thing that uh, allowed me to be in those shows, which is interesting when you were trying to use the names that they called them, because when they said, well, I, Marsha Tucker invited me to be in the Whitney uh, show that was anti-illusion procedures materials. But if, you know, as anti-illusion procedure, I mean, I'm not anti-anything, you know, but in any case, I mean, this, I just took it for granted because I read our forum that it was like this kind of jargon that they had, you know, to give weird names to weird, to kind of pretty simple things, you know. So Marsha said to me, uh, we want you to be in the show, just tell us what you want to do, and we'll give you the space, and, uh, but you can do anything you want. So I said, well, let's, so we went up to the fourth floor, and I, I picked the biggest wall, and I said, I want to grease the wall, and uh, put hay on the grease, and then break up the hay bales, and uh, she said, great, so I will tell the guys to put sheet rock so the grease won't leach into the permanent walls, etc. And I said, but I also would like to do an ice piece, because I've never used ice. And she said, oh, that's exciting. I said, well, I'd like to do it in the ramp. And uh, she said, fine. So that was the way that developed. And during the process of doing that, <clears throat> I would see Barry LaVey he would come every day with a bag of flour, which he would put 
into a little cheesecloth, mm -hmm. and he would spend like hours just patting the, and covering the floor mm -hmm. with uh, with white flour, mm -hmm. making a triangle. And I would see at the end of the day that he would take a vacuum cleaner and vacuum it. <laughs> and I said, how is it going? And he said, well, it's almost there, but not quite. <laughs> 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 then Richard Serra was melting lead, and, and he, he melted lead against the wall, and that was that splash mm -hmm. piece. And, and But I did not know all of the, what, these things were really about. All I knew was that I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and that I had to get the hell out of there as soon as possible, because I can't stand waste, spending a lot of time, you know? So the idea that I would kind of like study the wall to grease it, no, I had a scaffold, I got up there, and then I said, I gotta take the five o'clock train to Philadelphia. <laughs> so I literally did all of that, and then I didn't really see it until a couple of days later, before the opening, that I went back and I, and I looked at it and... And so, but I, I realized that during the opening of that show, which was a big affair, all of these people that were really, uh, that had a lot of clout in, in that art world of that period, uh, <clears throat> evaded my, my, my sight. I mean, you know, it was like I was, uh, too hard to handle or too hot or whatever, you know. And I, it's not paranoia. I mean, I, I've grown up with that capacity. To, I can tell when people really feel freaked out, you know. And uh, I said, gee, hmm, this is interesting. They don't like it. Well, why should they? It's a greaser, you know. The greaser <laughs> greased the wall. <laughs> so I was looking forward for a critic to write that. But of course, critics have to follow the liberal code. You're not supposed to call Hispanics in print, <laughs> greasers. <laughs> but you can do worse. You know, you can pretend they don't exist. <laughs> so that's the story. And then to, to answer fast your question, from there to this, it wasn't hard at all. Because I said, they don't like, they don't like, it's too hot. It's too intense, so what is the option? Well, let's make it worse. Mm. So I began to do woodcuts, and they would appear in installations and things. People would say, where did you get those? I say, what do you mean, where did I get them? I made them. You made them? Because you were not supposed to your hands. <laughs> so this is the birth of conceptual art and, and all of this other stuff, which now is completely wherever it is that you want to put it, but anyway. Okay. So when I kind of came into the situation as a very young guy going for the first time to museums and Whitney biennials and so on, uh, then I remember tents of yours. Now when you talk about the, <clears throat> this earlier work being uh, Hot. I mean, that was very hot in that a way, tends. and uh, you know, it clearly at that age for me, it sort of stood out in that context. It's something I still remember today. One hesitates to say how many years later. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what was, what was around them necessarily. That was in the in the early seventies, and and that came out of the of the <coughs> fact that I began to sense that so-called installations, which were not called installations at that time. They never were called installations. People called them pieces. Mm -hmm. You did an ice piece, you did a, you know, a lead piece or whatever. There were pieces that one did that took up a lot of space. They later became installations when they went to school. And that's when they began to teach how to make messes. And that's uh, the, the, what occurred. But in any case, I got tired of going from the East Coast to the West Coast, and everywhere in between, doing these things. And it became like really, I, I just didn't like it, because it, it began to remind me that I had a famous brother whom I loved dearly, it was my half-brother who was an actor, he won an Oscar. During my growing up, he said to me one day, would you like to act? I said, no, I'm not, I don't like the theater. 
and I hate musicals, and he loved musicals. So <laughs> the thing about it is that, you know, doing these things seemed to be getting to be like a performance, and I didn't like that. So I said, tents are great because they can be made and they can be transported. And uh, I don't have to go with them. So that's how they developed. And of course, then what do you do with a tent? Well, it, they weren't going to be minimal tents. They were going to be things with stuff around it. And that began the whole thing of putting you know, images and all kinds of stuff in them. How did you then, uh, I, you know, and I, I remember hearing you talk about this before too, this kind of uh, uh, discomfort with, with the situation of performing. And I just wonder, how, how had you kind of survived that as a musician where, where it's, uh, you, it's unavoidable that you, you, don't, you can't really make music without performing unless you become Glenn Gould and just uh, become a creature of the recording studio or something like that. Well, this is interesting because since <clears throat> you, you've never been a musician, have you? Have no, you? I've never. No. Well, the thing, the thing about music is that it really is not about performing. It's about the music. And if it's about the music, then what you have to do is you have to love the music and demand that that music be played at the highest level that you all, the group, can evolve during a particular time period. And <clears throat> the way you eliminate the, 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 the spectator is simply because your, your brain is, is totally in tune with what the pianist, the bass player, the singers, the trumpet players, what they're doing and the other percussionists, and you're reacting to that. And it's done at an at a incredibly fast rate of speed. You can't think, you respond like intuitively, so it becomes like essentially for a percussionist especially, it's like you're making, you're, act, you're doing accents. You're, you're stimulating the others to to be better, and I never was a fan of, uh, of like Tito Puente, who was a, a leader, and it was about him doing these shows solos, and I hated that because that was not. See, the people think that when a drummer is playing like things that seem very fast, that that's hard, and actually that's very easy because it's all it's all you you practice and you can get faster. But what's hard is to play very simple beats that are way open, mm -hmm. and you leave a lot of space. So that, uh, you know, so you get into all of these particularities, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there are very few musicians that I knew. It was a, a really terrific group. <coughs> They're almost all dead now, but in any case, at that time, uh, they were the equivalent of the greats in jazz, which is also a, a dying uh, art form, simply because uh, what produced people like Charlie Parker and Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk and Max Roach are, are social situations that will never exist again. There's the, the cost of space, the, the entrance fee to go to a place today, and I mean everything. It's just like we're talking about, you know, dinosaurs. It's depressing in a way. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking, I think maybe because of seeing the de Kooning exhibition at the uh, MoMA. You wrote a fantastic review, by the way. That, the, well, thanks. That, and I'm saying this right now. I, I mean, I, if you all have not read Barry's review of the De Kooning show, I urge you to get online and read it because it really is amazing. What You say a number of things there that no one has ever said because the other people say, this is the problem that I find with art criticism. Is most people that write art criticism are always hedging their bets and they're always positioning you know, where they want to be in terms of 
well, they have to watch their backs because if they get too negative, then you know they won't get the gigs that come from the big galleries, which are now like three. Mm -hmm. It's only three galleries now. You know, Gagosian, Gagosian. And I forgot the third one. <laughs> But I, I was thinking that was a whole, uh, this is something I don't talk about in the piece, that, that's a whole, I mean, he's only one example of a whole movement of artists who came into their own in the post-war era, but who were who they were and only because they had been through the whole era of the Depression. And right, that right, right, kind of right. fight uh, to survive in, in and, and de Kooning actually had to fight less because he had yeah, he, he was more able to make money than many of the others because of his skills as an illustrator and so on. But still, he, he lived it and he felt it. And uh, it's so different from, uh, let's say, the generation that came of age after With the war in the kind of American era of... Specialization. Specialization and of prosperity. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is that I have seen in my lifetime how there are two things that I've never been a political artist in any way. I never, you know, in fact, I'm not even a, a political person. I, I only began to vote when George Bush's father ran. And I voted for Clinton and that's began, I began to vote from then on. But before then, I never voted in Puerto Rico because I always felt it was a futile thing that it didn't make any difference. But what I have learned in the last 10 years, to put it simply in context, is that it seems to me that capitalism and democracy are enemies. Mm -hmm. And that there is a confusion going on that they both can coexist. But the question that I simply ask is, how can they coexist if democracy is for all of us to care about each other and to try to be fair and not take advantage. And capitalism, especially in this terminal condition that it is now, it's about destroying your enemies and just taking all the spoils. I think that, uh, I mean, it's funny to hear you say that you don't consider yourself a political artist because, uh, you know, I kind of have seen it otherwise. And one of the most political let's say, statements uh, that I found was simply when you talked about these paintings that you were making in the 80s and, and 90s. And in response, I think, to something that Roberta Smith or someone had written, you said, they're simply my neighbors. And uh, actually, that concept of the neighbor is one of the most political concepts there is. And it's one that actually Capitalism as such doesn't recognize. No, it doesn't. Yeah, there's only competition. I mean, on the route from there to here, uh, I had a dealer that said to me, don't bring me any more pictures of black people. <laughs> Nobody will buy them. It never occurred to me when I was painting them because I'm attracted to things that I'm attracted to. I mean, it's, I, I don't look at a person. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and, and rant, you know, and start naming names and stuff. But it just seems to me, it's quite obvious that there are strategies for success. You can become a person that fawns and you can pretend you're not fawning. You say, I don't, I don't paint, uh, I don't, I don't paint commissions. I only paint my friends. It just happens that they are you know, <laughs> well, I paint my friends, and they happen not to be. <laughs> so where are we? You know, what can you do? It's it's the way it is. You know, but the okay. Going back to the Kooning, the thing about the Kooning that is fantastic is that because he did make some money before he died, he knew that. What he wanted the most was to be left alone to work. It wasn't about making more money. Whereas now, 
you have to be completely uh, i don't know out of out of your mind not to see how clearly it is only about money because there are things that are otherwise they don't have any explanation you know yeah well and there they don't have an explanation but they're very simple uh, at the same time i had a, a kind of an odd revelation this guy uh, came came to dinner at our house, and he's a kind of critic and art journalist in in London. I didn't really I didn't know him, but our friend brought him. And he brought these um, uh, video tapes of these TV shows he'd done about the art world, and in one of them he was uh, interviewing all these people uh, who were in the really big money <coughs> end of the art world. These, uh, the, the Mugrabis, these people who are kind yeah, of right, right, the market right. on Warhol and Egozian and so on. And uh, what fascinated me was that in scene after scene, every artwork that was shown behind the people that were talking was simply very shiny. There's, there was no other aesthetic commonality except if you want to get, you know, Jeff Koons with the shiny, yeah, you know, right, steel right, right. sculptures and some Rayla with these very shiny metallic uh, paintings, yes. uh, Damien Hirst, all kinds of shiny <laughs> baubles. You know, uh, if you if you can make a kind of bauble on a grand scale, uh, in some way, then then it functions in in this level of the uh, of the art scene. Oh. There's, there's nothing very shiny here, by the way. <laughs> what's, funny, what's funny is that <clears throat> I used to be in a gallery that had a lot, of, a lot of terrific artists that I respected enormously, like Jack Dworkov and, and uh, Paul Tech and Malcolm Morley uh, in, in one of his earlier phases and uh, uh, Moskowitz, etc. And slowly, Everybody left, and I left, and I realized that <clears throat> the gallery began to be dealing with shiny stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it never got to be that expensive. They were smaller shiny things. <laughs> <laughs> they were ambitiously shiny. <laughs> they were not ambitiously shiny. So in, in, the, in the face of all this, tell, tell us something a little bit about the, the evolution of your work in, in this millennium, in, in the last 10 years or so. How? It, what, what has happened, it, for 10 years I didn't exhibit, and I just worked. And one of the things that is in me since I was born is the fact that I love language. And I had a father who was very old. He was 48 years old when I was born. And uh, he died early. Uh, and, uh, but he, he was a person that was really uh, passionate about literature and stuff. And, and then with the surrealists, that continued. Mm -hmm. And I, the, when I began to cut classes, because I didn't, want, I didn't like school, uh, I would still go to English literature, which in military academy of all places, it had a terrific uh, you know, English class. And so reading in Spanish and English have always been part of my, my uh, world. And <clears throat> then language itself, because if you're bilingual, then everything has possibilities that go beyond what the meaning of a person. Like one of the things I noticed early, and I told somebody way out in the early 70s, that there are certain things you can say in English that you can't say in Spanish. And there are certain things you can say in Spanish that you can't say in English. And English is terrific because it's very direct and specific. And Spanish is terrific because it can be incredibly subversive. And the the Spanish language, especially Spanish literature and poetry, is, <clears throat> is the, a world of uh, amazing levels of invention. So wit and, and the capacity 
to respond is one of the things that you treasure. And if you if you grow up in an atmosphere that respects that and stimulates it, it, it gets into you. So the whole thing, uh, I mean, there's a fantastic anecdote, which is there's two really famous Spanish writers of the generation of, let's say, 1898, and they hated each other. They just couldn't stand each other. They, whatever, you know, it was like, like this kind of absolute black passion, you know. And one day they're walking in Madrid in a narrow sidewalk, and obviously they saw each other, and one of them touched his hat, and the other one said, I don't greet sons of bitches. <laughs> and the other one said, I do. <laughs> <laughs> where it's at. You know, it's like an economy of, it, but it, it takes spectacular, uh, you know, sense of self to, to be able to, to it, that to me is like the equivalent of a solo by, by Charlie Parker, you know. There's certainly a lot of uh, looking ahead in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. attractions. Yeah. <laughs> So, the other, you, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. so no, I'm just trying to kind of reconceive some of these uh, pieces as tips of the hat to, <laughs> as it were, to various phenomena in our culture. <laughs> anyway, go. You, you were about to say something. Actually, I, I forgot what it, was. it doesn't matter because there's so many other things. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, but can, just to also to talk a little bit, I, I, I guess I want to press you to talk a little bit more still about the more recent work and... Um, well, the blackboards. Well, well, the blackboards and also the kind of uh, collages and, and... Right, right. They, they both... Uh, the collages, in a way, come out of the paintings the big, big paintings, because I <clears throat> began to, I mean, you couldn't paint one of those big paintings looking at the person, so I would do the small studies, okay. like, like those would, would, would be done in a couple of hours, mm -hmm. right there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> I took tons of pictures all the time. My wife and I would, both, would go around the Dominican Republic in this very, uh, in the Northeast, of the, of the northeast, is it? Yeah, northeast uh, of the of the island, uh, which was very uh, not very populated, and it was terrific. And there were a lot of Europeans that that gravitated there, and French and Germans that had these little uh, bars and and restaurants and stuff like that. So you had the combination of you know a, a kind of continental. Uh, presence with with an incredibly backward uh, social structure that was the neglect that Trujillo as a dictator of the Republic for 30 years he neglected that area uh, etc so <clears throat> the 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 uh, I I would take photographs and I would use them uh, to make collages and then use that to paint. Okay. So then that stayed and then I began to use, to make the collages that, that you see around uh, that, that are more sophisticated because they're more like for what they are. Mm -hmm. The blackboards began with this period of 10 years where I wasn't doing, I wasn't showing in any gallery and I began, I did 96 blackboards, all in black, white, and gray. And they all had either words in Spanish or things that images and words connected. And they were shown at the Museo del Barrio. Uh, and nobody really complained that 
they couldn't understand what what they said because if they weren't sentences necessarily, they were just uh, <clears throat> puns or I used foul language. You know, like I mean, I I like that because it's like supposed to, you're not supposed to mm -hmm. to use it. You know, in Spanish they call it malas palabras, which means bad words. Mm -hmm. You know, but there's no such thing as a bad word. I think the worst thing is silence. <laughs> Which is a very Nordic phenomenon. Silence. Yeah. I think that people, uh, it's funny that you say nobody complained about them. Maybe, well, uh, maybe there were different groups of people who, who failed to be able to read certain <laughs> pieces and the other groups did. Did read them and didn't read the, couldn't read the other ones. And then they told me, whatever, you know, but I never know. It's like people, you know, would come up and say, I saw this and you paint. I said, well, I really never saw that, but I'm glad that you did and now I'm thinking about it, you know, whatever. Or people will say, well, this means that. And I said, well, great, you know, because you can't control the way people respond to something, you know. And would you say it's a, that you find it in a more direct form of communication than, than painting in this sense? Or, uh, I mean, is that really, is that what the use of the word with the image is about, or? <clears throat> well, I, okay, that, what, what that question leads to is the fact, I think today uh, there is a review I think this weekend uh, by Roberta Smith about a show uh, at the Whitney of Sherry Levine okay. and she mentions how she began, Sherry Levine began criticizing uh, the whole commodification and the, the whole thing of the, of the uh, original. But then she now has a show that looks like it's a, it's a glorification of of this kind of fake situation you know and what i think is happening is that people really like things that are made by hand mm -hmm. and you know i'm not an economist by by you know whatever but i i can't believe that there will not be a bubble burst because I mean who the hell wants to to keep those big coons things you know that means those shiny things and, I mean it's like I, you know, I, I don't know I, I you know it's it's rough to to be here and then to start criticizing other artists because <laughs> you know art is not a, an easy thing and it's not something that uh, you know, you, you, you have any guarantee, but <clears throat> I think when, when, uh, when commerce takes over, and especially with the, with the, uh, the entertainment industry has really taken a huge beachhead in the art world, and not many art, uh, critics are are dealing with that or talking about it. But it's true. I mean, it's like, you know, the combination, today's an article, I haven't read it, by Ken Johnson about his performance. Is that, is it, what's the difference? I mean, is basketball a performance? Well, no, that's a game. But, so what is that performance? A boring thing done badly? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, this is the thing, you know. I mean, it's, it's like, <clears throat> You mentioned to me one day in conversation, we had lunch and we were talking about, conceptual art is really old, right? It's 40 years old, you, you told me? At least, yeah. At least. So the thing is that if you go to the origins of conceptual art, I remember minimalism, you don't want, minimalism is a, in other words, no one ever categorizes these things by saying, okay, everything, that follows is reactionary because minimalism is, re is a reaction against cubism. 
Now, Cubism happens to be one of the greatest movements that, or one of the greatest inventions, visual inventions. And it's not about uh, fashion, it's about <coughs> seeing differently. And yet you have these people that said, no more relational composition. Now it's got to be the integrity of gestalt. So if you, if you take a, a rectangle or a square and you, and you divide it, you break it. It then doesn't exist. So that is supposed to be the, the great value of minimal art. So of course, like in all of these things, especially when they've gone to school, they begin to be studied and they're not hard because there's not that many uh, original geometric shapes. So they run out of things to do with them so then you have a new group that is smarter, and they say, well, we don't want to make objects. We want to write things. So one square meter of rug removed from the office of a very wealthy uh, <laughs> businessman in Brussels. And you say, hey, Larry, uh, here's an invitation to my show. Uh, oh, let me give you one of mine. Will you sign it? No, 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 I won't sign it because there are hundreds of people that want my signature. Mm. And I said, well, don't sign it because if you do, as soon as I leave here, I'll sell it. <laughs> and then the person proceeds to write an original work of art mm -hmm. and dedicate it to me. Mm -hmm. And I still have it. And I can joke with Larry Wiener about it because we're both old now. And uh, he, I mean, I, to me, he's a funny guy. I mean, these guys were really funny. But it's like, a, it's like a kind of Yiddish humor, you know, that has nothing to do with being a philosopher. Far from it. I, I think it can have to do with being a philosopher. I say, uh, and I, I talk about that kind of humor, it's the, it's the humor of the double positive. <laughs> you know, this is a famous story about this, um, there was a philosophy, a philosopher who taught at Columbia called Morgan Besser. And uh, John Searle, who was the famous British philosopher of ordinary language, came to give a lecture. And Morgan Besser was sitting in the back of the hall. And Searle, not Searle, uh, Austin, uh, J.W. Austin. And Austin was saying, well, in, natural lang in some natural languages, uh, uh, a double negative is a negative. And in some natural languages, a double negative is a positive, but there are no natural languages in which a double positive is a negative. And from the back, from the back of the room, Morgan Besser said, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> but, but I do think a lot of you know when conceptual art is really good, it's it's it works like that. Right? Yes, it's and yes. it's that simple and. And minimal, if you want to, you know, call it like that. But the problem with, with those things that begin with a very narrow uh, arena is that they, they can only get more meager. Mm -hmm. So this has been the condition, because from, from, from conceptual art, meaning no objects, written stuff on the walls, then you go to body workers. And I remember Bob Morris, I, I, I said, what do you think? And he said, well, you know, the first one was the crucifixion and it didn't turn me off, turn me on. Then, then the, when Van Gogh cut his ear off, that was kind of like a downer. And from now on, from there on, it's been downhill, you know. And I think that, the, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, meaning that they didn't continue doing those things. But then you have, uh, a resurgence with Marina Abramovich and, and all the other people that are doing this. But I mean, you have to, yeah, I don't know what you do to get an audience, you know. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't sit looking at a person in the eyes like that for, for, for love or money, you know. And they're going to have a banquet. There's a, there's a protest right now. You know about it. I, I read about it, yeah. Isn't it great? I mean, Please, you tell. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact story. Okay, well, Yvonne Rayner, who is one of 
the people that really has had a, a very, very rough life, and she's an incredibly talented person uh, in dance. And she's one of the, the first uh, of the modern choreographers, and uh, she has not exploited her, her talent in, for, for money. And, and she wrote a letter to the director of the museum in LA, uh, Deitch. Jeffrey Deitch. Jeffrey yeah. Deitch. Jeffrey Deitch is having a benefit. Uh, I think it is between $25,000 and $1,000 entrance uh, to be. And in the benefit, people will be seated and there'll be dinner and stuff. But on the tables where you're eating, there will be holes in the center, and uh, some of the tables will have like four people who are kneeling on a lazy Susan under the table, and they will revolve around, and you're supposed to be looking at them in the eyes while you're there. And then there will be other tables with totally naked people with uh, laying on the table uh, with, with fake skeletons on top of them, mm -hmm. And in the contract for the performers, Yvonne Rayner mentions that uh, they have to be prepared not to want to go to the bathroom if they have to, and they they be prepared for fondling and not, you know, that kind of, of situation. And, and what Yvonne says is that, what is the difference with this and some other kind of real sordid I mean, this is like, I mean, where are we going, you know? It's bizarre, it's really bizarre. So it's becoming an ever more Baroque uh, situation of excess. Well, you know? obviously the 1% is getting more, more <coughs> bored and more bored. Because if that's what you need, then it really is getting nuts. Yeah. Well, we're inviting them to join the rest of us, the 99% <laughs> down here. Um, now, I'm not sure exactly what the, the time frame is that we're supposed to have for this. I'm wondering if it's not. If or, or if anybody has anything that they would question, like. Question, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about the paper bag? Uh, Actually, you I. Off, you start off with some con total conception. Do you do each one in individually and then the curator puts them together? I'll give you a, the only answer I can, which is straight answer, which is. In the period after the ice and the leaves and the grease and all that, uh, when things began to get really, uh, you know, like I wanted to crank up the fact that this is not good, let's make it worse, you know. So I decided to begin to draw on paper bags. And I said to myself, the only uh, rule I'll make for myself, which it will, they will have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and each one will be as different as I can make it from the previous one. And that's how they began in 1970 something. And they've continued that way and they, you know, I don't know if they've been consistent, but they've been, you know, they just keep, it's not, I, I love to do them, you know, but they have, sometimes I love to do things like, like that and working with, with galvanized, all galvanized sheets and stuff, you know. So who, who decides on the formation the, 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 so that the overall she's right the images. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's right next to you there. <laughs> because you can do what you want with them. That's what's the, so generous. So if you go to it's another, very generous. If you go to another show that's one you can, I can right. see the same wall or, or just one by itself. Wait, so how many are there? Any any idea? No, no, that's a thousand. Thousand. Wow. <laughs> I don't know how many there are really. I don't know. I used to number them, but I've lost track. You know. I mean, there were some of some done in Barcelona, like that El País. Uh, Mubarak is gone. The one on the upper left hand yes. corner. And that guy that looks like Wolfman, that says Brown there, backwards, that's uh, Gavin Brown, somebody I've never seen in my life. Uh, but I saw that picture. I saw that picture in, in, our, in our forum, in the, in the website. I saw Linda Yablonsky took a picture of him with this person next to him. And 
I just drew it from watching the TV and, you know. I didn't even know he was English. Yeah. Can you talk about that amazing painting? Because it seems to me that you're already taking on everybody in that painting. Well, that's, that's Lam, you know. And uh, when I went to Paris in 54, uh, I went with a university group, you know, one of those summer trips. I got to Spain and then I, I just wanted to go back to Paris because I knew Granel was going to be there and that seemed to me more interesting than just hanging out with all these dopes, including a bunch of cousins of mine that were in that trip. So I went the, back. The ones that became business people? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> when I went back to Paris, I would meet with the surrealists uh, every week, twice a week, in, in cafes. And I didn't speak French, but uh, Benjamin Perret, the poet, and uh, uh, Breton's wife, uh, Elisa, spoke fluent Spanish. So I could sit next to them and talk. And uh, then Granel one day took me to Glam studio. And I hit it off with Lam because although I didn't have the, the knowledge uh, to, to be able to talk about painting in, in, a, in, you know, in, in the way I could now, let's say, but uh, because I was a drummer and my music is Afro-Cuban music and he was fascinated by that because he really did not like that simply because it represented a world he wanted to leave behind. Because uh, Wilfredo Lam was, he had a, a Chinese father and a black mother, Cuban mother. And that's got to be the lowest of the low totem pole in discrimination in Cuba. To be, in fact, I remember among the musicians that I met and played with, that the, the worst put down you could be call would be a black Chinese because that would mean that you couldn't even clap on time, you know, let alone, <laughs> let alone play an instrument. But anyway, so by meeting Lam and then he gave me at the end of the summer because I we had lunch a number of times and I went to his studio a few times and at the end of the summer he said, pick a drawing and he took out this thing and I picked a drawing he dedicated it to me and said for the painter Rafael Ferrer from his friend Wilfredo Lam. And to me that's been the diploma that I never got from university. And I've always thought, thought about him. And then when <clears throat> the, the, there was a period where MoMA way before, uh, it was when, when uh, Barnedo unfortunately He's not around to defend himself, you know. But I never really liked his position. I didn't like how he got there. I didn't like all the other stuff from Ruben to him and whatever. And the thing was that there was this, the way they took the Pollock retrospective really just stuck in my throat because I thought it was just one of these, you know, like classic, you know, CEO power plays to establish, you know, the power of whatever, you know, over everybody else, etc. And I began to go to MoMA and I would see that there were always tons of people in front of the jungle mm -hmm. by Lam. And there were a lot of people that would go in and out of the abstract expressionist room, but they wouldn't stay there that long, you know. And I just exaggerated that in my brain by saying that, you know, there's something in the imagery of Lam that is so uh, intriguing. And <clears throat> so I began to do little drawings on, on pads and stuff, and I, I decided to do a painting. And it, he didn't look like that, but I, and he never dressed like that because he wasn't a believer in the African religions. But I knew from my musician uh, life that Tito Puente was going with his band to Venezuela on a tour and one of the American trumpet players was a friend of mine and he said to me, you won't believe this, you know, but we're all supposed to be dressed in white. 
everything has to be white, white shoes, white socks, white shirts, white ties, white suits. And we said, what the hell is going on? And he said, this was told to me by my advisor, that we have to be good for, for, the, for the African gods to protect us. And they said, you gotta be kidding, you know. <laughs> But of course, anyway, it is true that the Yoruba, uh, I mean the uh, Abakwa religion believes that white is like something. So I just put him in white and that's, you know, that's about all I can tell you. But I think his painting is terrific, you know. Anyone else? Yeah. Were you active in the avant-garde movement in the 70s? I'm sorry? Were you active in the avant-garde festivals and movement in the 70s? I, I don't the know. The avant-garde, like Charlotte Mormon, they had festivals. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I, I lived in Philadelphia, so it, I wasn't... In New York. I mean, it, to come to New York would be like a real... So that's one of the things that, in fact, was I not only was not involved in those things, but I, I was never involved in any of the things around <clears throat> the Hispanic community. Uh, not for any desire not to be, but simply because, you know, I, in the daily life, I would spend it working in my studio in Philadelphia. Well, this was not the Hispanic community. This no, no, I understood that, but I just wanted to, to give you a sense that I've also been reminded, you know, that I I didn't gravitate around the beginnings of the Museo del Barrio, you know, but the thing is that I didn't live in New York. And when Charlotte Moorman, I mean, I did meet Yvonne Rayner because she was had a relationship with Robert Morris and I met both of them at the same time and uh, and I did go to, to uh, performances of her and of the others from the Judson uh. And um, going back, you mentioned that you uh, went to Syracuse University. Yes. Uh, were you in the synesthetic school of art? What was I in? The what in the uh, synesthetic school? Of the sy no, 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 no. I okay. wasn't. And <clears throat> I began actually to to do the first art I ever did. I began at Syracuse because I had a small mu musical group that played in a nightclub in town. And uh, I got to meet a lot of writers and uh, composers and, and painters that would come. And <clears throat> I was really fascinated by painting. And I asked one of them, he said, well, I'm gonna bring a big Skira book. And he brought it and we went through it and I would ask him, well, why did this happen? And the, the book is called from uh, from something to surrealism, from from Picasso to surrealism, or something. One of those big big books. And anyway, that's <clears throat> yeah. But I uh, after I began to do those small paintings, I showed them to my friends that were painters, and they said, "Well, these are great. Let's show them to the people in the school." And I went, and I had never been in a painting class, and the teacher came out and he said, I don't think that you should go to school. I think you should just keep doing them. Again, something said that I took to heart, you know. I said, definitely, sounds okay, except I can't see nude models. <laughs> Which, when I went to visit, I, for the first time in my life, I saw this spectacular lady just posing there. I said, oh my God. <laughs> it's an era where Playboy hasn't come. <laughs> so so did, you, did you ever have any kind of formal, formalized training as a painter or, or something? No, because with Granel, uh, I went to the class and he had these little uh, cubes, rectangles, cones, Etc. And, and then said, everybody draw them with charcoal. And I mean, for me it was like, and he came over and he said to me, have you ever done anything before? I said, yeah, I've done this little, he said, bring him tomorrow. And I, next day I brought him to him and he said, don't do anything more. Just, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of books. Mm -hmm. so he gave me books and that's how I began to learn about Dada and surrealism. And 
that was the thing essentially that turned a switch on for me. Because I learned two things. The, the history of, of something that would carry me till death, till I die. And the other thing was that, <clears throat> what was the other thing? I'm getting now like, oh, I'm not having one thing. And the second one I forgot. <laughs> No, no, the other thing is that, that you don't learn anything with greater necessity or passion than if you, you have to do it yourself. This is why the whole idea of school, I think school should be for doctors, engineers, and people that do things that are, you know, really highly uh, dependent on exactitude and skill. But art, I mean, it's like there, there were never any architecture schools. There were never any art schools. None of the people that we admire uh, in art from the early 20th century went to school. They went to a place where they drew, and they, someone would come around and say, you're hopeless, like they told, <laughs> they told that to Giacometti. They told it to a whole bunch of them, you know. And they didn't give up. They just continued doing it on their own. And that's the best way. And change is good, but boy, to be cursed having to do a product, you know, that's, that's like working in a salt mine, you know. Well, clearly that's not a concern. Uh, no. That's not. <laughs> By the way, I wanted to tell the audience that I read about your poetry, and I read your poetry, and I the thing of the found poems. The discarded. Discarded, discarded yes. poems. I think that's a really key thing that Barry should share with you because it's got a lot to do with the way I see art and the way I work with art because I love found things because they trigger the, the fact that somebody has done something to something. This is why essentially everybody loves driftwood. What I like now is something that washes up that has an imprint of a human being, like a real, real worn brick, like a brick that was in a house, or a piece of cement that has all of this other stuff to it, stuck to it, or even plastic, like, a, like a, one of these awful plastic bottles that has changed color by the ocean. Anyway. It, it's funny because uh, my friend David Rhodes, who's here and visiting from Berlin, was uh, telling me that he uh, he greatly admires Hans Hartung, the <coughs> yes. German kind yes. of Ecole yes. de Paris uh, painter. And tell me, correct me if I get the story wrong, David, but he met someone who had been one of Hartung's assistants, and when she found out how much he loved Hartung, she said, "Oh well, you must have this," and she gave him a piece of the of linen from that had been hard tones from his studio, not with anything on it, but just, and just it, yes. And then he made his own painting on the linen. Only he knows which one it is, or uh, that it has the ghost of Hartung uh, haunting it. But uh, yes, yeah, so the fact that uh, that these things have kind of vibrations from exactly. from other people, and the fact that they they didn't finish it or they couldn't finish it. Uh, means that it's it's still available for someone else to to try and, and and elicit what that vibration was and to do something with it. Yeah, and and it confirms a whole bunch of things. Meaning that that it triggers something in you simply because of what is there. You know, it's just like like if you if I listen to to. A, a rhythm section that I haven't seen the heard the beginning and I don't know where it's going to end and just if it's interesting it creates all of this sense of what it's possible to do he's a man after my own heart because when when I was at Skowhegan the, the year that I went to spend the summer teaching there uh, Milton Resnick was one of the teachers and he it was a joy to, to be with Milton and hear all his stories of the Kooning and, and of Torkov and of uh, uh, Guston. 
And at the end of the summer, we were all supposed to clear our studios, and he was cleaning his studio, and he had this paper pallet that was full of the most gorgeous cadmium red and all these colors that he used. And he had this painter's brush about that wide stuck into it. And I went and said, Milton, what are you going to do with it? I said, what do you think I'm going to do? I'll throw it away, you know. So I said, can I have that brush? And he said, sure, take it. Take everything. And I took the brush and I still have it. And to me, it's like a, like a talisman, you know, like that, you know, it's that, that thought. And uh, Max Roach played with a concert that was done here in, in the South Fork. Uh, when Peter Jennings would do a yearly thing for the benefit of the uh, domestics that worked uh, in, in, in the homes. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Jazz at, at Lincoln Center, uh, Winter Marsalis, mm -hmm. put a group together and the drummer was one of my great all-time heroes, was Max Roach. And uh, <clears throat> when they were, took a break, I went up to him and I said, hey, listen, I don't know if your sticks are like made to order or they're particular kind of thing, you can't part with them, but if they're just sticks, if you were to give me one stick at the end of the night, it would mean a lot to me. And at the end of the night, he looked at the table I was sitting at, he went like that with the two sticks I went over, mm -hmm. and then the guy that was taking care of the instruments, said to me, tell him to sign it. I said, sign it? The Knicks are the sign. Uh, That's the signature. Yeah. It's, and I have it, you know, and it's that same thing. It's like having a sense that there's something innate in these things. But you can't get that from, from uh, Gagosian. <laughs> you can't. You cannot. It's not transferable. And it's not commercial, you know, as much as he's trying. Actually, he's coming out with a, with a catalog that I look forward to seeing, which is uh, Rauschenberg's personal collection. Ah, nice. There's a show of that. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you so all right. much. You've all been